thank you both for being with us. And Raji, I want to start with you. Sprinkler has been a longtime partner to the list, really our, our lead data research partner. But as you know, we've made some changes. Tell us, tell us from your perspective um, about the role Sprinkler plays in this and, and maybe um, a bit briefly about how the methodology has evolved since you've, you've been evolved, involved. Well, it's year seven. I'm super thrilled to be a part of this effort. Uh, and, you know, we look forward to getting this out every year. Um, and together, I think we are creating one of the most data-driven lists that I've ever seen. And this year, uh, specifically, we, we've been looking at 20 different dimensions, which is the most we've done. Yeah. And that spans uh, five broad buckets. The first one, as you know, is um, the influence that the CMO has on the world, followed by the influence that the CMO has on her or his community, which is other people like them. Um, third is the influence the brand has on the world. Uh, and fourth is the influence the campaigns that you run as a CMO has on the world. So it's not the quantity. And the brand. Yeah, and for the, for the brand, yeah. yeah. So it's not the quantity of the campaigns or the pure quality, but how is it perceived by the world? And lastly, this one is an interesting one and a new one, the financial performance of the brand itself, which I think is a really multi-dimensional good way to look at it because you, you can't really be a good CMO if your company is not doing well. You can't be in a connected world, you can't be a great CMO if your brand is doing well, but you're behind the scenes and you're not influencing the brand the way you personally can because of the line between advocacy, influence, and brand is it's all blurring. and you know, brand is the experience today that your employees and your customers and your partners and your investors, and they all create for you. Yeah, everybody is a marketer these days. I do want to say that I think, I think it's possible to, in fact, be a good CMO and still have the performance of the company not be what it might be. Mm -hmm. but, but I think to your point, and I think one of the reasons, Mel, before I turn to you, that we added those financial metrics mm -hmm. was as some proxy of the impact that the chief mm -hmm. marketing officer, who is an engine and driver of growth, is having. But thank you so much. It was a terrific overview of, of some of the, the, the changes we've made broadly. But Mel, as I turn to you this year, um, how long has LinkedIn been working with us? Three or four years now? Five I or six? I think it's five or six. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we really kind of upped where and how um, your data plays a role in the calculus. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's been, it's been a fun journey. It's been an honor to be a part of the list. And Seth, I really appreciate, I think, both of you that this focus on making the list about influence is not something that can be that is superficial or that can be gamed, but influence is like truly influence on the business and the financial metrics speak to the impact that CMOs need to be having on the business. And so I really appreciate that. So I think last year we really got more global in our data, yeah. um, ensuring that we had true global representation. And then this year was fun. We took a, a representative set of our 950 million audience, about 20%, so about 150 million that really are the business leaders and the marketing leaders to be able to look at the influence that CMOs have on those audiences. And we looked at things like uh, followership and engagement on posts, comments, reshares, re re reposts, um, and likes just to understand like is the content and the things that these CMOs putting out in the world having an impact on these audiences as a real proxy for influence. Yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, you, you both remind me that perhaps I've been remiss in not setting up kind of a thesis of influence as we built this list. And so to the audience, you should know that the, the way we look at it is influence on brand and business influence on the marketing community broadly and influence on the world. And influence in today's world, and this is really a question for the both of you, it's, it can be quite hard to, in fact, isolate the influence of any one individual and their impact on certainly enterprises of scale, really regardless of what role within the company that they do play. Um, you both sit at the center of this industry in different ways. And I'm wondering, what are your individual perspectives on how a marketer's influence has evolved? And Mel, why don't I start with you as a chief marketing officer? 
Yeah, you know, again, I love that you are spending how much thought you are bringing to our industry around this topic of like influence and, and business. Um, I like to say that the brand isn't owned by marketing, um, but we sure as heck own governing it, measuring it, influencing it, stewarding it. Um, and so we may not have responsibility for every aspect because I think the brand is every interaction that someone has with your company. Um, but I do think we have accountability for ensuring yeah. it shows up in the world the way that we would want it to. So um, I think it's a super interesting time. I don't think you can separate brands and CMOs and the impact. We, we sign up in this role yeah. um, for being- For better or worse. For better or for worse, <laughs> for being stewards of our brands in the world. Yeah, which has only become harder in a decentralized world where anybody with a keyboard or a camera can influence the destiny and character of a brand in an instant as we've seen over and over again for good and ill. Raja, you touched on a lot of what Mel just did in terms of talking about the ingredients that go into it. From your perspective, and, and you know, you, you see so much data across so many brands, how, how do you think the role of, of the marketer and marketing influence has evolved? Well, thank you. So we work with about 1,400 of the biggest brands in the world. So we get to see this cross-section of how every brand looks at influence. And I want to talk about, like, not just a concept of influence, but the concept of, you know, I'm just going to call it disinfluence. Um, the brand of yesterday was made by CMOs running clever campaigns. So it would come up with a beautiful campaign, air it on TV over and over again, and that became your brand. And so you had the best car if you said you had the best car because there wasn't that much disinfluence happening. And what's happening today is you can influence with those traditional brand building techniques, but your product, your employees, your customers can start disinfluencing whatever it is that you just said. So I think every year the CMO has to play a bigger role internally than she'd ever did before while continuing to play the same role externally. And that's a, a fascinating shift that I, I see CMOs have, having to make across I, the board. I, I, love, uh, I, I love the language of disinfluence. It's, it's not a word I've heard before, and I think it's, I think it's perfectly I just apt. made it up. Well, you, it's good. <laughs> and I, I can tell you saying it, doesn't make it true anymore because I've been telling my kids I'm the tallest in the family and <laughs> it, it's not true. Well, so um, can I add too, because we, um, we just did some data on this, which is, you know, you have a world where the macro changes, the cultural changes, the technological changes are some of the most fast and, and pronounced that we've seen in a long time. We saw in our latest B2B, and most of my data comes, most of our clients are B2B, so B2B CMOs, but we saw that um, two-thirds of the C-suite saw the influence of CMOs increasing. And I think it speaks to what you both have said, which is um, navigating and, the And I'm sorry, just for the audience, that's two th two-thirds of the B2B C-suite. C-suite. Correct. Right. Um, saw the influence of the CMOs increasing, and they want it to, because that's a massively complex set of factors to navigate your company and your brand through, and they're looking increasingly to the CMO to be able to do that. Well, I, I think that's a great segue, in fact, to the next question, Mel, so I'm going to stick with you for a second longer, which is more and more B2B CMOs seem to be integrating what we might once have considered more B2C marketing approaches and tactics. Um, in an effort really to drive differentiation in pursuit of bottom line impact. From a B2B perspective, or, or think more broadly, what do you think, and back to the context of the list, what do you think the relationship is between chief marketer and brand as they add up to create influence? Because of course this is a, um, a list, the world's most influential CMOs list, is about the individual, but you cannot divorce brand from impact. What's your take on it? Yeah, it's funny. We had about 40 B2B CMOs yesterday, and we talked about this. Is it B2B? Is it B2BC? And there was a conversation that's like, really, B2Human? human Like, we're really all talking to humans, so B2B buyers are humans first. Um, so there is a lot of distinctness in the B2B buying cycle, but there's a lot of overlap in terms yeah. of the humanity, the emotional uh, appeal, the promise that you want to make um, as a marketer. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier, but you know, I, I don't think you can separate 
the brands from the, the influence. I think we sign up for that when we sign up in, in the CMO role. Um, and, uh, and we sign up for all aspects of it. So in this world, there's massively all these factors coming at the brand. And I, I think it's, it's increasing the stakes, but it's also increasing the importance yeah. of the role CMO has to influence externally and internally. I mean, massively important that your whole company believes in, understands, and knows how to steward your brand going forward. I and mean, we're at LinkedIn, we're a company that 20,000 employees are free to post and, and carry the brand forward critically important from the marketing perspective that as they carry the brand forward, they're carrying the brand into the world the way that we've defined it, the values that we have for it, and do it consistently. Like That's probably most important. It's interesting that that's kind of taking um, a centralized approach to some kind of influence over the decentralized nature of mm -hmm. marketing communications yeah. today. It's very, very I smart. I don't think you can absolve yourself of the response, even though it is decentralized and you don't have responsibility for all the pieces. I believe I have accountability yeah, for absolutely. how uh, how they understand and how uh, all of it. My boss tells me our job is to communicate the value of LinkedIn to every single audience. And then our job is to do that consistently so it shows up in the world in the way that people can trust it and yeah, interpret it. Yeah, absolutely. Raji, what's your take on the same question, relationship between marketer and brand? I think uh, uh, experience is the new brand. Mm -hmm. It's not what you say it is. Uh, and, and so I think CMOs should see themselves more as chief experience officers. And, and experience is employee experience, customer experience. So. Going back to what we were talking about before, if, if, if your product is not as good, people are talking about it or leaving bad reviews, it doesn't matter. If your employees are you know, not reflecting the culture, it doesn't matter what you try and say. So I, I keep coming back to this idea of the CMO has to own experience, which means that CEOs have to give them a much broader remit than they've ever had. And if I could personally call all CEOs, I'd say get your CMO to face inward as much as she's facing outward um, because that's the only way you're gonna, you're gonna, she's going to be able to do a job. Yeah. You know, your, your, your answers are remarkably aligned in terms of the perspectives you both see on, on kind of the operational role, how the operational role, which of course leads to influences evolve. I want to build Mel for something off of something that Raji just said, which is in order to imbue the CMO with not just the accountability, but the authority to drive the experience, she needs buy-in from the rest of the C-suite. Yeah. And I'm looking at some data from LinkedIn's B2B marketing benchmark report, which showed that less than one in five CMOs broadly strongly agreed that the CFO or CEO within their organization prioritize investment in brand building. What's, what do you know about that broadly from the benchmark report and what texture can you add to it? Yeah, it's funny, that's, that's one data point from the report, but the report was actually more optimistic on that in that um, coming out of this last year, actually more than 60% like of the C-suite actually understand the importance of brand. So there may be a lapse between what's happening now and where, but, um, but I'm actually pretty optimistic that, um, that the C-suite understands um, that companies, how companies show up in the world and this idea that you can't just be a performance engine, that there is something above it that creates demand and creates an emotional resonant for your product and your company in the world. Um, and it was actually interesting, the same report said that 60% of CFOs believe and have more confidence um, in their CMOs and their CMOs ability to, um, to drive revenue. But I think that that partnership is then also as CMOs get better at explaining to CFOs and CEOs how you drive revenue, that it is not just a bottom of the funnel game, that it is both creating and capturing, and the brand's a huge part of that. I'm optimistic that the right conversations are happening and that right level of relationship is happening across the C-suite. It, it is interesting. I do think, I do think um, my perspective talking to a lot of CMOs is that their C-suite partners tend not to recognize, often, yeah. painting with a broad brush, that brand is the greatest performance engine in the history of performance engines. Yeah. And that while the vernacular has changed over the past decade, the premise hasn't, totally. and attribution models are kind of screwing us up. Raji, you, you mentioned earlier that if you could talk to every CEO, or I suppose CFO as well, 
you know, you would tell them some how, how to view the role. Well, you know most CEOs in the United States, so you can, in fact. And I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, if, if you could call them up and say, here's what you need to do to give your chief marketer more investment resources to build brand, what's the case you'd make? I think, you know, look, I think brand and revenue feels like you know, there's something missing in the mm -hmm. middle. And that's not how I think about it. I, I think experience is the new brand. And most CEOs and CFOs understand that experience drives revenue. So I've got a brand new CMO who's been with us now for about a year, doing really well. And what he and I talk about is not driving demand, which he's got to, right? I run a B2B company. His responsibility is to drive demand. But you can't drive d demand and screw the brand up. So the key is driving demand in a way that's consistent with the brand that you want to create. So we at Sprinkler want to create the world's most loved enterprise software company. So you can't annoy people on your way to, <laughs> that's to trying to consistent. drive demand. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's a new balance. So again, I keep coming back to experience is a new brand and experience drives revenue. So if it was up to me, I, I would almost ask CEOs to consider moving customer service under marketing or bringing them together somehow because they all have to work together and they all have to drive revenue. One thing I've been counseling CMOs to talk with their CFOs about, um, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but I'm really optimistic about how that partnership is evolving, um, is this notion of tr not trying to divorce brand from performance, which you and I have talked about. M many is, times. Is one of the biggest traps that marketers have gotten themselves into. But talking about this notion of you can create demand and you can capture demand, but you can't capture demand if you don't create demand. And I think CFOs and CEOs really understand that language, which is like there are so many components of creating demand, but one of them is belief in your brand, belief in your company. Um, and so I think when you, I think there are things we can do as marketers to shift the language, both the way we measure, but also the way we talk about what we do to, to have more impact. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, as you know, which is we've created as a, as a marketing community this, this false binary. Right. Oh, totally. and, and it, you know, we, we have a bit lost control of a narrative and found our, find ourselves now. Which is ironic because the marketers, right? Which is a bit <laughs> ironic given what the marketers do. Okay, I do have, um, I have a last question for both of you as we come to the end of this. Also from uh, the LinkedIn B2B Marketing Benchmark Report, 52% of chief marketers said that one of the biggest challenges they find, right, is getting to a more direct role in driving revenue, which seems a bit perverse since we've been talking about the imperative of driving demand, which of course results in revenue. Um, that was the number one answer, their number one frustration. This was, of course, the first year, as, as you've both mentioned, that the Forbes World's Most Influential CMOs list brought in some measure of financial um, impact, yeah. right? We looked at <clears throat> um, revenue growth and we looked at stock performance. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you see the increased responsibility of, of driving that bottom, or the increased want for the responsibility of driving that bottom line impact, taking, taking shape both in terms of strategy and measurement. And Raji, why don't we start with you? Look, it's super obvious that your brand cannot be divorced from revenues we talked about. I think it's about time that we align compensation for CMOs with financial performance, which is kind of uh, the next, next uh, frontier. I do think that CMOs can drive revenue, should drive revenue, and must drive revenue. So we have to align performance and compensation with, with that, that, uh, that thesis. So if your CMO is not on a company plan, if it's not aligned with both revenue growth and stock growth, I think she should. Yeah, Mel? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think most CMOs actually would be willing to sign up for it. I think you talked about in the past, like attribution issues have a lot of times got in in, in the way. But um, most of the CMOs or the new generation of CMOs that you're highlighting on the list and that I know, I think would be willing and sign up. There's a couple, there's a, a really interesting cultural 
phenomenon happening is we see more and more decision makers coming into that are millennials. They're digital natives. They're digital first. It is going to be more and more incumbent that we reach them through digital channels, most of which are probably marketing driven. So I think it's like it's the right time and it's the right place. Um, that I, I alluded it to earlier, but the 60 60 percent of CFOs, so actually more than CMOs were optimistic in marketing's ability to drive revenue. So that was, to me, one of the most interesting findings of the report, which is CFOs actually want and are optimistic about partnering with their CF CMO partners to drive this change. Um, and so I think we're on the front end of a really interesting time for CMOs to be those business drivers, and I think they're ready. I think they have to be because, of course, you know, the role of marketing, as much as has changed, what hasn't changed is that marketing's fundamental role is about capturing attention and influencing attitudes and behaviors in service of driving that impact. And you know, Mel, you've, you've talked uh, a couple of times about the difference between being responsible and accountable. And the CMO is certainly held accountable for an absence of performance. Mm -hmm. So too should they be held accountable for positive performance. Sure. And uh, you've both spoken so eloquently about the evolution of influence, the evolution of the role of the chief marketer. Thank you so much. Thank you for your partnership with Forbes on um, certainly this year's world's most influential uh, CMOs list, but for all the years past. Uh, and to both of you, uh, thanks for being a part of it. And um, the evolution, uh, literally, you're tracking and measuring the evolution of CMO influence. So thank you so much. Thank you.